Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Wherever this finds you today, I hope it finds you well. My name is Janet Hoder, and as Senior Communication Specialist with CGIAR, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's FAO Science and Innovation Forum side event, Supporting Small-Scale Farmer Resilience with Inclusive, Transformative Climate Tools and Policies. This session has been organized by CGIR Research Initiatives on Plant Health and Climate Resilience. And we're grateful to you for joining us, whether you're here with us live or watching the recording at a later time. Already among the most vulnerable, small-scale farmers living in marginal agricultural areas in low and middle-income countries face increasingly severe climate change impacts, ranging from climatic extremes and variability to dev and devastating plant pest and disease outbreaks, to economic losses and unemployment, to inadequate access to improved technologies, these impacts exacerbate existing inequities. Today, stakeholders from a variety of experiences and perspectives will explore the relevance and next steps for improving climate resilience, food security, and livelihoods of small-scale farmers by adopting innovative, integrated, and inclusive tools and policies. Before we get started, I have a few reminders for those here with us today. Um, your cameras are off and microphones are muted for the duration of the program, but we will invite you to use the chat function or the Q&A function rather to pose questions um, at any time. Um, we'll draw on those later for the discussion. So please feel free to, to put those um, in and, and we'll address them a little later. Um, and we are recording today's session, just a reminder there, so, um, for rebroadcast at a later time for those who are unable to attend today. We have a very full program for you. So without delay, I'd like to introduce Martin Kropp, Managing Director for Resilient Agri-Food Systems with CGIAR, who will give opening remarks. Martin. Yeah, thank you, Janet, and, and welcome, everybody. It's, um, um, it's an honor to be here, and it's also a pleasure that uh, we have now the activity of two major initiatives of the CGIAR uh, together. Let me uh, take on my slides. Um, so that we can start straight away because we are a little bit uh, late start because of the technology. So, but um, the key is supporting small scale farmer resilience with inclusive transformative climate tools and policies is a very complex issue. And now we have um, uh, the initiatives for CGIR, one on climate resilience at the high level and one on plant health. And I'm very proud that they are now uh, together organize this uh, side event because we are now using more systems approaches in the CGIR, bringing things together because we cannot find silver bullet solutions anymore. But first of all, the, the issue, I don't have to say much about it, but everybody knows climate change is real, widespread and intensifying. It is getting worse, uh, worse than uh, we predicted 30 years ago. Then um, uh, 30 years ago, we uh, made an analysis of the impact of climate change on rice production with the models in those days. Um, the, the climate models predicted more or less what's happening now, but it basically is worse. So, um, uh, and it has a major impact. And I will just show briefly some things, but of course the speakers of today will give you much more detail because it has major impact on plant health issues, but on yields, uh, on the livelihoods of people, um, Etc. So um, and this is the other issue that's coming up. It's not just climate change, but it's also the number of people in the world is growing. This is in a logarithmic scale. Um, and you see, it's not completely linear, but it's still going very strong and high, especially Africa. So um, uh, basically, but I keep on saying 2 billion extra people in the world by 2050, um, where will they be? Mainly um, uh, in South Asia and in Africa. So um, it's the logarithmic scale. So Oceania it seems like a big switch, but of course it's uh, starting very uh, low levels. Um, so number of people, 2 billion extra in the most vulnerable area where we have already 800 million people hungry every day. So we need 60 to 70% more food. And now with the Ukraine crisis, we know it has to be with resilient local regional food systems because um, uh, you know getting all the food from all around the world is making countries very fragile. So the key challenge is how can we collectively protect the food security and livelihoods of smallholders in the global south? We have 500 million of them. They are responsible for 40 to 50% of our food uh, globally and build resilient agri-food systems. This is a major challenge, uh, has made many dimensions, 
And today we discuss uh, two very important components of that, plant health uh, and, um, and climate resilience. Now, we built a CGIR um, with our partners, a new research and innovation strategy. So basically with novel approaches uh, to confront food, land and water crisis, with scaling action areas and performance measurements, fresh portfolio of initiatives, 32, um, uh, and in the resilient agri-food systems uh, science area that I'm leading, we have um, uh, 15 of them, uh, including six regionally integrated initiatives where we are really demand driven. What is your problem in the region? Can we together with the national systems, with the private sector, with the government and international organizations, can we see what the bottlenecks are and then how can science help to solve it? And then of course we have five impact areas very close to the SDGs, nutrition, health, food security, poverty reduction, uh, livelihoods and jobs, gender, equality, youth and inclusion, climate adaptation, mitigation and environmental health and biodiversity. And especially youth is a very, very important one uh, next to gender because the youth, the young people have to be the farmers of the future. So our overall mission, as I formulated most of the time, is contribute to agri-food systems transformation for affordable, sufficient and healthy diets produced within planetary boundaries and that in a climate crisis. It's just one sentence, but it includes so much. Um, and that's what we try to tackle with our organization and basically with our partners through three components, mainly genetics, better seeds, um, better genetics in uh, and breeds in animals, better management, agronomy, um, uh, livestock management, etc., and better governance, better policies. Now, this slide summarizes it all. I hope you can see uh, my screen and my mouse. This is the worldwide uh, average yield since 1960, Green Revolution. I'm very happy that we had a Green Revolution. Otherwise, we could only feed 3 billion people that we had in those days. Yields went up of major staples globally, not so much in Africa, to be honest, yet. That's coming now, fortunately. But the challenge is, uh, following the, re the requirement of food, we need the green dotted line here, the projected demand by 2050 by FAO. So this is a huge challenge because that means that the growth of the, the annual growth of the crop yield has to increase. And then we have, of course, the new diseases coming in, bringing it down. We have water, nutrient and energy scarcity. I don't have to explain to all of you. Going, bringing it down. We have climate change itself, bringing it down. So there's a major challenge and with agronomy, breeding, etc., whatever we can, we have to bring it up. And um, so that's a challenge that is bigger than in the last 20, 30 years. Can you imagine? Um, CGIR with the partners, we are ready for it, but we, we have to realize it's not a small challenge. Now here you see, for example, what happens with wheat and maize, but with other crops as well. So this is in temperate regions, no, sometimes the yields go up in several regions. So that's uh, with climate change, that's okay. But in the tropical regions, in the global south, where we have all these smallholder farmers, or most of them, yields go down of all the crops. And, and the next slide shows it beautifully. I got that slide um, through one of the speakers today. Um, the non-linear responses of crops, because what you see is that a temperature change um, in a temperate zone doesn't have that effect. It's going with the up and down, but there's some modeling in here, of course. But above 30 degrees Celsius, yields go down. And in many cases, and we've measured it, for example, in Obregon, in wheat yields in the last 10 or 20 years, one degree uh, Celsius um, uh, higher gives six to 10% yield loss. That is really a lot. So in the regions where we are at the edge right now, like in many region, tropical regions, um, we have a problem. Now, plant health is also very sensitive to changing climate. So rising temperature, change, uh, temperatures, changes in precipitation, uh, droughts, atmospheric uh, CO2 increase, human activities, that gives very often a situation that's favorable to increase pest and pathogen establishment and movement. And of course, uh, pathogens, they don't like droughts most of the time. But um, we get very irregular uh, uh, periods and, and uh, things so that pathogens also find themselves, unfortunately, very well um, as well. So uh, climate change has also already expanded host range and geographical distribution. Uh, we all know what happened with um, fall algae with uh, all kinds of pests and diseases that move up. Um, 
So, and so the risk is becoming bigger and bigger. And I've always been afraid that with all the staples that we have, if new disease or pest comes in, in a big way, um, it can wipe out so much of our, um, uh, uh, our crops, uh, in that sense, our food. So we need inclusive and transformative climate tools and policies. And um, I assume that one of the speakers later will explain this slide better, but the, the benefit of adaptation is vertical, horizontal is climate change. So we have incremental adaptation. That's what we have been doing all the time in the last 50 years. Do varieties, different planting time spacing. You can do a lot with it. Um, nutrient canopy management or water management. But we are already in the situation where we need systems adaptation. So climate change ready crops, climate sensitive precision agriculture, diversification and risk management. But we have to go further. Transformational adaptation. Climate change is going so fast. We need transformation from land use uh, or distribution change. New pro products such as ecosystem services. So we have to think, especially in science, the next stage. Because it's going fast. So that's um, with this, I would like to welcome everybody, all the participants, to this very important session. And as CGIR, with our partners, we are looking for solutions. We identify the problems. But the key to get with the partners is that we find solutions for the most important people, I think, uh, in the world. That's, these are the smallholder farmers, most vulnerable people as well. Thank you. I'll stop sharing, uh, Janet. Thank you, Martin. And, um, and thanks so much for, for laying that out. And I think that that's a, a really interesting, um, you know, kind of position that we find ourselves in is where not only are the the challenges that we're facing increasing in intensity, but the speed at which um, we're, we're feeling those effects is increasing also so fast that it really does challenge us to find innovative solutions to stay, you know, to try to get ahead of the, of the problems, especially for those most vulnerable. Um, the solutions really do have to be um, innovative and transformative. And fortunately, that's what we're here to talk about today. So thank you for setting the scene there. Um, and um, I'd now like to introduce John Helene, co-lead of CGIR's research initiative on climate resilience, and Prasanna Badrupali, who leads CGIR's research initiative on plant health. Those are the two initiatives Martin was referring to. Um, Prasanna is also director of the Global Maize Program at the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. John and Prasanna will deliver today's keynote presentation jointly um, and set the scene for us on how resilience includes both ecological and development dimensions um, and how this will require um, the, the inter and transdisciplinary approaches um, that Martin was alluding to a little bit in his remarks. So and in this way, innovative technological interventions are critical, um, but the enabling social, institutional and governance environment um, is what drives the transformative process. And I am not doing justice to that at all. So I'm gonna turn it over to our keynote presenters now. Um, John, over to you. Thank you very much, Janet. I hope everyone can see my screen as I try and... Great. Okay, well, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, thank you, Janet, and thank you, Martin, also for a fantastic start to this uh, session because my short eight minute keynote uh, follows on very nicely from what you and Janet have been talking about and then uh, Prasanna will take over. So I co-lead one of the CGIR initiatives on climate resilience. Um, you'll be delighted to hear that the lead of that you'll be hearing from at the end of this session, um, Ana Maria Lobo Guerrero. I've entitled this short eight minutes uh, with the full title of the initiative. The initiative short title is Climate Resilience, but it's really, the full title is Building Systemic Resilience Against Climate Variability and Extremes. And I just want to take you to, it's not just a vision, it's a reality in many parts of the world, but it's also a vision of why we're all here. Why are we working in agricultural research? Why are we working on crop insurance with farmers? or working with seed companies or with USAID or whatever it might be. The title of this slide is the one taken from the overall side event, supporting small scale farmer resilience with inclusive transformative climate tools and policies. So we're focusing more on sort of Philippines to represent Southeast Asia and Kenya to represent East Africa, but these are not regionally completely sealed. So let's just say on the left, and 
rice-based system. Martinals had a very nice picture of a rice-based system. And what we're working towards is a climate resilient agriculture, diversity of crops, so hence the rice-based, uh, good ability to tackle the uh, increasing pest problems, schools, health clinic, roads for imports and exports, et cetera, et cetera. Something that exists in many places, the objective we have and the challenge is to scale that, to make sure that more and more places are climate resilient. And a picture on the right with a woman picking tea, cash crop, uh, linked to markets, and again, wanting to ensure that that particular agricultural system thrives. So one could take all the SDGs and look at these agricultural settings and say, this is what we want to have more of. As Martin pointed out, not only is that a challenge just from a agricultural point of view, but now with the increasing impact, adverse impact in many cases of climate change, we've got to step up how we respond to the climate challenge. And the right on the right is uh, the front cover of a IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, which came out in February this year which makes extremely sobering re uh, reading with respect to the climate challenge and how we've got to increase that climate response from incremental to transformative. So increasingly, we're hearing about terms like systems transformation. What does it actually mean for us? And it's really the framing for this overall session. And in many respects, the framing for a lot of what the CGIR does and agri other agricultural researchers. What we're looking at is a process of societal and environmental change where different actors, not just researchers, different actors work to change collectively a system towards greater sustainability. And I think this is one of the particularly interesting areas that we're now both thinking about theoretically and very much in practical terms. And that's when we talk about climate resilient agriculture, I guess in the past we would talk more about climate smart agriculture, but I think climate resilient agriculture is probably a better term. And I like it, and it's part of the overall thrust of the initiative Climate Resilience, because we unpack what we mean by resilience. I think for a lot of people, the ecological resilience would be the thing that springs to mind, the persistence and recovery in the face of change. How resilient is an agroecological agro system to the climate changes which are coming about? Will it be able to bounce back? Can it be made climate resilient? But increasingly there's a recognition that resilience is also development resilience. And this was a paper that came out in the proceedings of, uh, of the National Academy of Sciences some years ago, but I really liked it because it talks about development resilience being concerned with individual agents, farmers, with basic rights as well as aspirations for improved living conditions. So resilience is human development as well as the agroecological resilience. And the third bullet point manifested an intertwined socio-ecological and technical systems approach. The IPCC report talks about transformative adaptation. The fact that the climate response has really got to tackle the root causes of vulnerability and recognizing that not everyone is, you know, is, suffers from the same vulnerability in an area impacted by climate change. Very often the, the wealthy are able to take advantage of extension provision can um, have access to climate smart agricultural practices, can make their agriculture climate resilient. Elite capture is something we grapple with the whole time. We also don't want situations where well-meaning climate responses fall into the trap of exacerbating inequality so that those best positioned to benefit, benefit and benefit more, and those who are more marginalized in a community or in communities are not able to take advantage of the climate resilient tools and you get growing inequality. This is what's called maladaptation. So a series of trade-offs and being cognizant of who's winning and losing and how we can get to the root cause of that vulnerability. 
to my last slide, and the title here, Improving Climate Resilience, um, is taken um, from, from the flyer for this event. And it comes down to these two areas that Janet mentioned just before I spoke. The recognition that much of the excellent agricultural research and other work that's gone on over the last 20, 30, 40 years and continues with the development of technolo technologies and practices are absolutely critical to that climate response. But we also need an enabling social institutional and governance environment. And Martin, one of your slides had governance in it because that's what drives the transformative process and allows for the scaling. And the way we're going to meet that climate response and therefore have more examples of those two pictures I showed of the rice-based system and the woman picking tea in, in East Africa is through inter and transdisciplinary approaches. Basically, scientists working together and scientists working with a host of different partners, which is exactly why the organizers of this side event have invited people from the private sector, from the donor community, if you want, USAID, from the insurance industry, so that we work together. We don't all have to be experts in our fields, far from it, but we want to broker these relationships so that we can bring about that climate resilience. And we're now going to go down into much more detail. And I want to hand over to Prasanna, having set the scene for why we're bringing together plant health, resilience, human development. And Prasanna, over to you to talk about plant health and climate. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And uh, thanks, uh, Martin, for setting the uh, stage for this uh, uh, important session. Uh, what I will focus on now is on plant health management in the context of uh, climate resilience. Uh, there have been several devastating epidemics uh, globally over the last 10 years. Uh, if you look at Africa alone, there have been six devastating epidemics uh, in Africa in the, in the course of last 10 years, including the Falami bomb, the maize lethal necrosis, the fusarium wilt TR4 in banana, and so on and so forth, and bunchy top and cassava viruses. Uh, this requires a revitalized strategy and innovative approaches. Uh, we will come to that a bit later, but what is important is also to understand that climate change is not just about abiotic stresses and their increase in frequency and magnitude of impact, but also the close interrelationship the abiotic stresses have on a number of pests and diseases. If you look at maize itself, uh, drought, high and low temperatures, mechanical wounding, uh, UV radiation, salinity, water logging, metal toxicity, nutrient deficiency, all of them have a very vital bearing on the incidence of major diseases and pests, including the ear rots, the aflatoxin contamination, uh, insect pests like falami worm, the maize weevils, toxicum leaf blight, MLN, stock rots, stem borers, uh, there has been uh, a, a, several publications on this close link. Uh, Shalonar uh, and team recently projected the impact of future climates on both the productivity of 12 crop species and the temperature dependent infection risk from 80 fungal and wumicid plant pathogens. And this paper, which came up in Nature Climate Change last year, uh, highlights the that that's the a suite of crop diseases that farmers face in some of the world's most productive regions will change dramatically due to the changes in the climate. Uh, they also point out that while crop yields may increase in certain high latitudes, these gains could also be severely impacted by parallel increases in the disease risk. Uh, uh, incidentally, Europe, China, and Peru were particularly highlighted as areas at the most risk of such new and emergent diseases. Let's also recognize the fact that uh, the climate change uh, aspects have a disproportionate impact on smallholder farmers and marginalized communities. Uh, climate change, as, as pointed out by Martin and John, uh, is not just an environmental issue, but is a very important social issue. Uh, there is an inequitable access of women and marginalized communities to key information, the inputs, as well as services, including the plant health services. The low and middle income countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America 
are home to socially diverse and resource constrained rural communities uh, and who are typically dependent on climate sensitive livelihoods. So the key question is, how should our actions positively impact climate adaptation, food security, and livelihoods of a large majority of rural women who drive agriculture in many of these continents and who need to be positively impacted by our technologies or innovations or services. Uh, the CGIR Plant Health Initiative therefore focuses on different aspects, threat identification and characterization, preparedness and rapid response, integrated pest and disease management and integrated mycotoxin management. Alejandro Ortega, who is in, uh, who is attending this workshop now, is leading uh, the mycotoxin management uh, work package under the Plant Health Initiative. So this partnership includes not only one CJIR centers, about 10 of them, but also international agricultural research centers like CABI, ECPE, World Wedge, and most importantly, 86 non-CG partners, including the national partners, NPPOs, and development partners in 40 countries uh, in the global south. So this work initiative actually builds on the foundation of work CGIR centers together with partners have carried out over the decades in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, uh, including on pests like Fala Mivam, MLN, Banana Banchita, Potato Disease Management, Cassava Brown Streak Disease, uh, and, uh, and you name it uh, in diverse crop, uh, uh, crops of, uh, that are important for this, uh, for the global south. So my final slide, uh, we, what can we do better in terms of protecting crop health and food security and livelihoods of farmers in the context of climate resilience? Uh, global crop health data management tools, standards, protocols, and policies uh, have to be radically transformed. We cannot make this sustainable without building the trust and capacities of the partners, especially in the global south. Integrating crop projection models with the multifaceted effects of individual pests and pathogens, if we have to develop and deploy climate smart food security policies. Proactive crop health management, supporting farming communities to adopt gender and socially inclusive climate smart practices and plant health management. And finally, we need a better coordination globally on plant health research for development. So we look forward uh, to the perspectives of uh, uh, the attendees as well as the panelists today uh, in this side event on how best we can achieve these objectives. Thank you so much. Over to you, Janet. And John, sorry. That's all right. Thanks, Prasanna. Thank you very much for that. Now, we want to drill down um, a bit deeper after the presentations you've had and explore some of these climate health issues, plant health issues, and the technologies and approaches in order to combat those particular challenges we face. So we've got two people who are going to come to talk to us now, one representing the situation in the Philippines, broadening out Southeast Asia, followed by one on Kenya, and then we'll have a brief chat with both of them. So it gives me extreme pleasure to um, welcome Alice Laborte, who's a senior scientist and research unit leader of climate resilient landscapes at the International Rice Research Institute here in the Philippines. And her research focuses on the use of spatial information to generate evidence, actionable information, and insights to inform policy, research prioritization, and effective targeting and scaling of innovations, which is obviously critical to having impact. So Alice, I understand you've just got a few slides to, uh, to, to whet our appetite with respect to the work that you and your colleagues have been doing. Over to you, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon from the Philippines. Um, could you confirm if you can hear me and see my screen? We can, Alice. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'm pleased to share with you our work at Erie together with national partners in developing digital solutions to support the government in addressing food security, climate, and pest risk. So in the Philippines, we have developed and operationalized a satellite-based rice monitoring system. We use remote sensing, uh, specifically Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture radar, 
crop modeling and smartphone based surveys to map rice areas and planting dates, uh, as you can see on the screen, and estimate mid season and end of season yields. Knowing where and when rice is grown is important as this gives information in advance when there is a delay in planting and when there is a potential shortfall in production. Knowing where the yields are low, as you can see on the screen, um, the red areas uh, in, in this uh, particular region have yields of only two to three tons of per hectare, way below the national average. And these are areas where we need to target productivity enhancing technologies and interventions. In the event of a flood or drought, rice areas at risk are identified and damages are estimated. In this particular example, a typhoon in April 2022, um, an assessment was done to identify which of the rice areas are along the typhoon cyclone track and their respective growth stages. Afterwards, a flood assessment is conducted to, uh, using satellite imagery to estimate how much of the rice areas were affected. And this provides information much earlier than traditional procedure for damage assessments. So we have done these flood assessments to, since 2015, covering about 42 uh, flood uh, incidents in the country. And we have identified where the flood prone rice areas are. And we find that about a half a million hectares of rice are flooded at least once during the six year assessment period. And nearly 200,000 hectares of rice are flooded half of the time or once in two years. And you can see here on the map is the central Luzon, which is the rice bowl of the country. And this is where most of the rice fields are flood prone. And in fact, 12% of the rice areas in central Luzon uh, were flooded half of the time during the assessment period. In addition to mapping uh, rice areas and abiotic stresses, we also had a project uh, also funded by the Department of Agriculture, which is called PRIME, or the Pest Risk Identification and Management. Here we developed a national protocol for crop health monitoring, wherein trained extension agents throughout the country, armed with a mobile phone, um, monitor rice fields, about 2,800 rice fields throughout the country for incidents of pests and diseases, and submit the data to a central server. Now, based on um, the pest surveillance data, pre-semester bulletins are released by region to inform technicians about the commonly observed pests and diseases in their respective regions and the relevant management recommendations they should provide to farmers. When there are elevated pest cases, the system automatically sends an email to project partners as well as relevant DA agencies like the Disaster Risk Reduction Management and the relevant regional field offices to identify, um, to validate the observations and make sure uh, and to assess the extent of the damages in those particular areas. and also provide uh, crop management recommendations to farmers. So these are two systems that are operational already in the Philippines. PRISM, uh, since our handover in 2018, and until now they have been providing maps of rice areas monthly, mid-season yield estimates, and end-of-season yield estimates. And PRIME also has been operational since June of 2022. Thank you very much. That's great, Alice. Thank you very much. Um, lots of important issues there around essentially the contribution of what could be classified under the title digital tools, working with different actors in pest surveillance and enabling targeting. Let me just, if I may, Alice, if you can hold, I'd like to turn to the second of our speakers and then, Alice, I'll bring you back into the arena and we'll have a chat with the second speaker, which is uh, who is Dr. Joyce Malinga, who works with the Kenya 
Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization as a Director of Planning, Performance Management and Quality Control. She was previously the Institute Director of the Calro Food Crops Institute. She's an entomologist, breeder and seed systems expert and is passionate about push, uh, pushing improved seeds to African smallholder farmers. So Joyce, uh, the floor is yours for a short presentation and then you, Alice and I will have um, 20 minutes or so, 15 minutes to, to chat about some of the issues that both of you have raised. Thank you very much, Joyce, over to you. Thank you, John. I don't know whether you're able to share my screen, please, my, my presentation. Give me just a moment and I will pull it up. Thank you so much. As that presentation is coming on, um, um, I'd just like to say by way of introduction, thank you so much for having me on this session. It's I'm very highly honored and so is Carol. But above that, I would also just like to appreciate the first uh, keynote address that was given. And I uh, would like to say thank you for the need for social resilience with regard to plant health. In the second uh, uh, keynote address, the, the fact that there is need for um, a global mor moral approach to plant health has also been raised. I, I was astonished and thought that um, this is probably <laughs> the place to make a case for Africa. And uh, uh, the person who's just come before me has talked about the use of technology in managing plant health uh, issues in rice. I would like to say that um, I, I think this is timely to see technology being used for uh, managing and mitigating uh, uh, plant health is really big. In, my, in my, the three slides that I'll be presenting to you, you'll get to see some of the challenges that Africa, and especially with reference to Kenya, face in mitigating plant health matters. And next slide, please. Um, I decided that uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa, the thing that's most important to them is food. And so I chose to use the, 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 the maize, which is our most important crop. And uh, Prasad is here, he will tell you. For example, in Kenya, in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, and most of rural South Africa, if you do not have maize, you do not have food. And most governments give focus and attention to food. So I took chance to communicate to the breeders who are attending a, 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 a seed production technology for Africa workshop. Actually, they've just left and asked them what they thought were key diseases and key insect pests and key weeds for maize. It's, it's very interesting as you look across the countries, the colors show, Takikam, for example, if blight is consistent across all the, the four countries, Prasanna Zia would ask, what, what are you doing about that? Gray leaf spot, again, consistently constant. I'm not pointing these things out to show that there is, a, there is a problem in focus. No, I'm saying that some of these problems may be more widespread than we imagine. And because there is no one looking at them except those particular countries, and those countries look at them individually they attempt to look for their solutions individually. And I've really liked what Prasanna has said that about a global approach to plant health. Perhaps this is the time. I look at key insect pests, for example. Four lamiwam came to the attention, for example, of CIMIT because it just disseminated crop maize and also affected other, other cereal crops. And therefore, there was a sort of global approach towards it. But there are many other uh, such pests. We have maize stock border, which we almost live with it. You know, you say, OK, we'll spray. In fact, spraying is the most, uh, the use of uh, pesticides, the most common approach. And then we have storage uh, uh, pests. Uh, many people would say, would not encourage the use of actelic, for example, in, 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 in storing maize. But that's what's available. It's the cheapest. It's easily accessible. Hematic bags are, are, are recommended. They are expensive, but they are the best. And I use them too. But these have not been, have not had widespread um, acceptance yet because of their price. So it's sometimes it's easier to buy that 
small sachet of, 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 of actelic and, and dust your, your, your maize. When you look at kiwis, for example, and I'm still only focused on one crop, maize, you find that striga hamothica, there is some work done across, uh, of course, countries on uh, 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 kuch grass, nut grass consistently. But how many people can work on these? Do the CGIR have the staff? Is there a need for a focus or, uh, or, or towards the plant health issues? What I know and what has been my observation over time is that diseases rank most important with regard to plant health. Whether it comes globally, whether it comes per country, and followed by insect pests and weeds are somehow uh, um, neglected. I would just like to focus on Amaranthus palmieri, a new weed that is uh, uh, prevalent in Southern Africa that is of gaining importance. It's interesting because uh, it, it's been reported and uh, they think that uh, it's something that people need to look at. And we want to wait until it has spread everywhere before we, we, we take action. Please, next slide, please. I, 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 I decided that looking at some emerging and invasive pests in Kenya in recent years may be uh, something that could probe your thoughts. Before I go to this slide, I would like to say there have been pests such as Bactrocera in Vardens, which affected mango. So bad was it that, uh, and 203 in Kenya. And this focus is specifically just on Kenya. So bad was it. And, um, um, uh, we were really, our mango was rejected. You couldn't export mango from Kenya at all. We were banned. And uh, similarly, we've had another uh, uh, pest that affects tree plants, and this is Doda. I remember in 2014, a, a county coming over to my office when I was a, a center director in Kakamega requesting for help to work on the Doda. It is now 2022. Doda has spread its affected tea plants, its affected hedges. Do you know, you feel the helplessness that we don't yet have answers of how to manage Doda. You know, we are told that they drift along in the wind. There isn't that budget to put in the control of Doda. And remembering that we, borders don't have walls, that Doda will definitely fly over to the neighborhood. And one time it will reach Europe it will reach Asia. I think those are the things that you need to consider and think about. Here I present uh, three specific um, uh, uh, diseases and insect pests that have gone beyond the boundaries of Kenya. And the first one, and I would like to talk about the virulent UG99 stem rust disease in, in wheat, uh, Paxinia graminis uh, uh, species triticide. The, this particular pest, when it first started emerging, I think no one really noted. It's uh, first reported actually uh, that it may have been as early as 1999, but when it was actually physically now quantified and seen that it is a real pest, Ravi et al. Uh, uh, reports it in his, uh, in his publication that was actually 2006 when, when it was actually determined that there was this virulence uh, uh, stem rust disease that was disseminating all the crop varieties in Kenya. So bad is it that every so many few years it changes, it, it mutates. But what's so interesting is that fortunately it caught the eye of CIMIT and all the countries panicked and many people have been bringing their lines, 60,000 wheat lines from different countries are brought to Njoro because no one wants to take stem rust to their country, but they can be sure that they want to prepare for stem rust uh, in case such uh, an epidemic breaks out. And I think what uh, uh, Prasanna said, that kind of global approach is probably what is needed. I would like to say before I go to the maize lethal necrosis, necrosis disease that in Africa, we have priorities. Our priorities to make sure that our populations who are poor, and someone did say very clearly, Hence the issue of social resilience, that they have food on the table. So anything that attacks food, we will take care. But of other things that may not be a need, if I may use that word, perhaps we may not have the resources to put there. So I really look at uh, the need for global approaches being important, a different kind of way to look at things holistically. I don't want to talk about the maize lethal necro necrotic disease because Prasan is here. But for Kenya, it's been devastating. 
lots of, of losses for, for the country. Someone estimated, uh, uh, Mahuku, that in, in 2012 only, shortly after this pest had been in the field for just one year, we had lost uh, crop yields of maize worth uh, USD 50 million shillings, 50 million. And that really went on to affect other African countries. He's worked very hard, Prasanna has worked very hard to get varieties because of that approach, global approach, and I continue to emphasize that. The last pest, and uh, that is the Folami one, which is more recent, which has been for me an interest, uh, uh, seeing in 2016 it grow, it affecting all, almost all 43 out of 47 counties in Kenya, and at least yield losses of 20% in 2018, which could feed Kenya for two months, were lost. People didn't know what to do. Seed companies were desperate. They didn't know what to do. They tried everything. All the, uh, some of the pesticide companies made a kill. But really, that is the challenge that we have. Next slide, please. Next slide. I think that as I come, I only live with one example, and this is probably my very second last slide because the others just references. And I chose this for Liamiwam. If you look at the, the this 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 uh, map that was um, drawn by the Groot et al. Simit uh, fell and reported, he was able to 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 show how for Liamiwam started in 2015, the dark green, and grew all over and covered the country by 2018. I would like to share that what we were able to do as Kenya. Of course, there was surveillance. We tried close seasons. It wasn't very easy because for communities that continually plant maize so that they can have enough food to eat throughout the year, this was like a no-no goes on. But they, people had to be punished so that they can shut off the full <laughs> amiwam uh, cycle. There was wide areas spraying. These were government initiatives. There was use of insect traps in, in, in farmers' fields. There was monitoring of weather changes. At this time, Calro developed the Kenya Agriculture Observatory platform that was able to monitor weather to see, and, and that helped him be able to uh, predict when a Folami Wam attack would come. And of course, ongoing uh, together with uh, CIMIT is the development of, uh, of resistant varieties. Ladies, last, last slide. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the last slide merely shows just some of the selected references where some of this information came apart from the communications and my own personal experience. Thank you so much, John. Thank you very much, Joyce. That was that was great. And also as a, a former employee of CIMIT, it's very nice for me to be reminded of those sterling efforts around UG99, et cetera, um, which I believe also involved um, FAO and uh, former colleagues of mine at CIMIT with that. We don't have that much time for, for, for the discussion, but I want to link what um, the, the keynote presentations had and something that both of you have said. When it comes to climate change and plant health, listening to both your presentations, there was clearly the importance of research per se. So whether it's PRISM, PRIME, the work that Erie has been doing, Joyce, you referred a lot to CIMIT's work. But really the impact has come through collaboration with government organizations, with private sector. So the question for both of you, and I think um, Joyce, you said we as Kenyan, you know, how did you confront full army worm? That wasn't just Simit doing it, Simit played a big role. So Alice, if I could turn to you first and then you Joyce, how did those, how did that collaboration come about? Um, Alice, with you, with the, um, with the, with the use of PRISM and PRIME, where did the interest grow from and what was the role of government and CIMIT, uh, and uh, ERIE in the private sector? How did you bring about that relationship, which then you were able to hand over to the Philippine government? Who brokered it? Thank you for the question. So it's actually these two projects were funded by the Department of Agriculture. So based on, uh, discussions of their requirements, what they would like to see. Um, and that's how we started with the discussions. And one of the requirements that they said, they even emphasized this is we don't want another project. We want an operational system. So that was mentioned right from the start. And actually PRISM started that and 
After that, most of the projects funded by the DA in the Philippines now requires a sustainability plan. Like they don't want, as I said, they don't want a research project. They want something operational. And they will always say this, we don't, I mean, you, you take care of the publications without, we want something that can be done, can be implemented. Of course, like if you want this to be like an academic exercise, you have to be very stringent in terms of locating sites where you will do the assessments, right? But here we also take into account that if they will be doing this, monthly, it has to be practical. Otherwise, they're not going to do this. Uh, and the, also an important aspect is to involve them right from the start, because we really need champions. At the end of the project, there's no more money, right? There's no research money. So that means they have to include this in the national budget for the organization that will do this afterwards. So we uh, had a lot of discussions with the undersecretary of the DA for operations because this falls under his purview. We had several meetings with them. We also involved some key people as part of the project management team to make sure that we respond to their specific requirements. For example, for, for PRISM, our proposal was to have like a mid mid-season estimate of rice area and then yield and then end of season. And they said, no, that's not enough for us. We need monthly. And so that's how we started. And then they would say we need it every 10th of the month because we have a reporting period where we would like to use it. So we tried to adjust our protocol to make sure it fits their reporting requirements and adapt it to their particular requirements. And I think that's how you get a system to become operational. Because if you develop it on your own and then say, here it is, use it, it's not going to work because they want to be part of the development. Uh, it takes a little bit longer because we have a lot of discussions to make sure that it, it goes in the way that they want it. But I think that's the best way to, to do it. And, and you also talked about partnership with uh, private companies. So we partnered with a SARMAP, so an, uh, also an, uh, as for the remote sensing for the technology so that it becomes faster and much more operational. So um, a lot of these engagements, so we also worked with other departments, for example, for the crop health, we worked with the Bureau of Plant Industry because they have the mandate to do this. So you have to partner with the right people. It's their mandate for the crop health, pest surveillance and monitoring. And also we partnered with regional field offices because they are the ones who will implement this in the field. We cannot hire people to monitor the fields or if we do that, it's only until the project ends. So what happens afterwards? So all of these things have to be taken into account right at the design of the project. And that's why they have to be involved. That's great. Thank you, Alice. You, you've really touched on so many key issues around partnership because partnership can be where often we in the CG have been accused of this, that we do research and without really including others and then you know hand things over at the end. But actually what you've described is a process which was completely different. It was really collegial from the word go. So, so Joyce, if I could address uh, the same question at you, picking up on whether it's full army worm or UG99, how, you know, referring to we Kenya did this, how, was it the Kenyan government? Was it was this initiative coming from CIMIT? How, how, who brokered, who brought in the private sector? Um, how did you manage to to bring about the the, the, the surveillance and the um, and the effect, you know, increasingly effective way of dealing with some of these uh, pests and diseases? Oh, thank you. It's a very hard question, but anyway, well, first I would like to say that we have a a, a good relationship with CIMIT, and uh, our scientists work closely together with them. Some of them are seconded to CIMIT. And others work alongside, at least they have a small or a component of, 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 of the CIMIT work. Furthermore, if you look at one of the slides that I presented, it was actually Dr. Wangai, when she was a scientist in Cairo, who first identified MLN in the fields and also first identified polyamorphism. It's very interesting that, um, you know, you are the people on the ground. You're the ones always working with the crop every day. So when you are, as you survey, you know, you're like, okay, what's this? This is, this looks different. And because of the kind of relationship we have with the, with CIMIT, 
and they are also working within the same fields, we are able to share with them. But let me also say that the government itself, when it noted that there was a need, invested uh, 1.5 million uh, US, US dollars actually in uh, giving to the scientists. Can you get us a solution? But told the scientists, you can't work alone. You have to work with the uh, with, 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 with extension officers and, uh, and other regulators. But uh, secondly, there was seen that the easiest and most possible solution could be pesticide use. So there was engagement uh, between government, county governments, with uh, uh, many of the pesticide uh, uh, organizations, without naming one, because I would be prejudiced if I did, but really, they really were able to provide and avail the quantities they, that were needed for those farms. And they were not few. Apart from that, they were able to give us different quantities as they themselves were also screening because everybody wanted to know what could work. We started off with what th we thought could work for other uh, maize stock borers, but alongside with them, were all, they were all racing for them for profit, for us to help people, yep. to make sure that the farmers have an alternative. Uh, to be able to to get something that could uh, work for for controlling the fall army. I mean, in this case, even MLN, which was a crazy thing. I, I although I've seen the expert for MLN is here, I just want to say as a as a scientist from Cairo that we were invited also alongside, for example, by uh, Simit to look at the MLN fields with with regard to our maze. It was devastating. There was nothing. Everything was dead. But uh, two, two years, three years, every year would come and see the, what's happening. Yeah. And it's been a joy to be able to see the change. Thanks. That's, I don't know if that answered your question. No, that did. That's great, Joyce. Thank you very much. Sadly, we are very, very close to running out of time on this. But um, I just want to ask one quick question with a very, very brief answer. Um, Alice, you mentioned the importance of mobile phones. And I know, Joyce, that um, when I was working on digital tools, and the use of mobile phones. The issue around um, gender that comes into that, um, certainly in the past, mobile phones were more readily used by male farmers and female farmers. So just a quick question, Alice, with your work on mobile phones in the Philippines, has there been any look at um, whether there are gender dimensions to who's been able to access information through mobile phones? And then Joyce, I'll say same question to you in a moment. Very briefly, Alice. Actually, we didn't look at this, but there's a lot of usage of mobile phones in the Philippines. I think the concern that we had was the more uh, the more older farmers that comprise uh, the farmers now have less access to mobile phones. But uh, we did not look so, at that. But nice. I mean, we you know we talk about Martin was talking about the importance of youth. Youth is also youth and elderly. So there we mm. have a situation of older people less um, digitally savvy. And mm -hmm. I fully understand that being in that towards the older category. Joyce, what about you? Are there gender dimensions to the access of information through mobile phones or other digital tools? Okay, very quickly. First of all, mobile phones is the most commonly used thing in Kenya because we all use M-Pesa, mobile money. Yep. So everybody has at least a phone. The only thing I would say is the kind of phone you have. So um, maybe ages 55, and I'm not quoting anything and below, I don't have any data to, to that, would be having a smartphone. Above 55, most, most likely they just have a regular phone, which you can use to call or draw money. So as you do develop any tools, be thinking, keep that at the back of your mind, the kind of phone. All the people, of yep. course, uh, women are just as interested, age is the factor much more. Of course, youth with smartphones. That is yeah. very prevalent, I think, in, in a very brief answer, because we don't have time. Thank, thank you very much. Joyce, Alice, thank you very much for presentations and great um, discussion. Janet, I apologize for running over time and making your life even more difficult. Over to you. Thank, thank you. you. Not at all. And, um, and thank you to John and Persona, but also to Alice and Joyce. And I hope you'll all stay with us, because I think that there are some things that um, that you've touched on in just a really rich um, set of presentations and discussion that we'll definitely want to dive back into when we get to our, um, our, our open discussion toward the end. 
Um, so thank you all for that. And we're now going to move into the panel discussion um, portion of our program. But before I introduce our panelists, I do want to take this opportunity to remind our audience, you can use the Q&A function to add comments and questions um, to Alice, to Joyce, to John, to Prasanna, to any of our panelists um, as, as they come up, and we will get to those in the next portion of our program. So we're going to start our discussion first. Um, now to our panel. So we have with us today representatives from a variety of perspectives, um, sort of a, a different entry points as we consider how to support small scale farmer resilience. And so I'd like to welcome first Pramod Agarwal, Regional Program Leader at the Borlaug Institute for South Asia, Tor Edwards, who is the Feed the Future Coordinator and Economic Growth Office of the US Agency for International Development in Tanzania, Jarek Laud, Vice Senior Vice President, excuse me, with Pioneer Insurance and Surety Corporation in the Philippines, and Gordon Mabu Yai, uh, Global Head Research and Development at Seedco in Zimbabwe. So Pramod, if I may begin with you, reflecting on your years of experience, um, what would you say have been the successes and failures on climate resilience and, and what lessons um, have you perhaps learned that you would share with others? Okay, thanks, thanks, Jeanette, for this question. It is three parts, and I'd like to address it in three parts, success, failures, and lessons learned. And if I could say in terms of success, well, there are, there are lots, but not really that, that large, but key success is sensitization of different stakeholders. I think today we have a situation where there's local, regional, as well as global stakeholders that are all sensitized about need to address climate change and need to build resilient strategy. I think that itself is a major success, which has resulted in development and lots of national adaptation plans, inclusion of agriculture discussion in Paris Agreement, and so on and so forth. So that's that, I would say, is a major success at global scale. In terms of technologies also, we have seen lots of success. Of course, not global to that extent, but development of heat tolerant wheat varieties, flood tolerant rice varieties, drought tolerant maize varieties, and so on and so forth, and their increasing adoption in global south. So I think that's also quite useful development. Uh, similarly, increasing increased adoption of conservation agriculture, like laser labeling, zero tillage, we see the statistics suggest that that's increasing, especially in South Asia and Africa. Also, we have seen a lot of progress in terms of tools and techniques, especially in terms of modeling, remote sensing and machine learning, like what Alice just mentioned. Again, tools to support building resilience. I think so these are some of the key successes, which I could say from my perspective, well, failures are too many actually. Uh, you know, so, in terms of success, I mentioned all countries have come up with their NDCs, but that's the intent only. In terms of action, I think practically every country is failing. There's not much happening in terms of real action at national scale or at global scale, largely constrained by finance. I think that's, that's one major challenge that we see that despite all of our research, lots of discourses and transformation, we haven't been able to mobilize global finance for, to address agriculture problems. Other failure that I see is that uh, we are seeing more and more helicopter science, and in not only science, but also policies and overall vision. Lots of people, you know, who keep talking about all of this without really totally understanding the problem. In a way, that's causing harm to the whole issue of addressing uh, this uh, climate resilience. But these people are very active, very active on social media, have gained lots of importance, especially in global platforms, and they really have a big say. So lots of lots of people are trying to move to helicopter science and policy. I think that's in a way failure and moving away from real problems. The last point in terms of failure, I would like to say is that we researchers are increasing confusion for society. We keep coming up with new phrases, new terminologies every second day, uh, reasons we all understand. We used to have sustainable agriculture and climate resilient agriculture, climate smart agriculture, nature-based solutions, agroecology, regenerative agriculture, and hundreds of other variants. 
everybody trying to support building of climate resilience. As a result, what is happening? Stakeholders, and in fact, researchers like me are also getting totally confused. What is that we are trying to do? Every second day, we come up with a new definition, and and then we drop them, you know, very soon. And I think these all of them have shelf life of five years. So, in a way, lessons learned. To if I come to the final question, I think one lesson, at least, which I have learned, that technology is never enough. I think when we talk about system transformation, and uh, you know. We got this uh, definition reemphasized re again about system transformation. The key thing is different actors coming together. And Alice also elaborated in her presentation how different actors had to come together. But that's happening at a relatively small scale. And that's something that we have known for ages. Go back 50, 60 years to Green Revolution. Seeds were never enough. You had to have uh, policy, appropriate institutions, and stakeholders' capacity, all of them, and they came together, Green Revolution became a success, not otherwise. So I think we still really need to keep reinventing this, uh, re-emphasizing that, yes, if we really want transformation, we need to bring all these actors together, but that's a tall ask. It's not easy, especially at large scale. We have seen this in recent times, in relation to COVID, for example, how vaccines were monopolized. We see this again in terms of food security due, during this recent conflict in Europe. So there are lots of examples where, although we all talk about collective action, bringing actors together, it doesn't really happen. Uh, and just to elaborate a little bit more, research alone is not sufficient. We really need, uh, you know, the challenge is not always research. In fact, many times research is not the solution, although we keep coming with research solutions. Many times in Global South, the challenges are poverty, literacy, capital, and so on and so forth. Not necessarily always technology. And I think digital agriculture is one classical example where we use mobile phones, as we just discussed, have become so common. And there's a lot of top-down messages being sent to people, whether they need it or not. And how do they really make use of it? We advise that, okay, plant this variety of seed, but where is that seed? We say, okay, apply this much irrigation, but even if there is no irrigation. So, you know, so this is, these are some of the lessons that we have to learn to make it more demand-driven, site-specific, and not necessarily global solutions. I'll stop there. Thank you for that. Those were some really important points, I think, that you raised. And I will say that one that jumped out to me was from a communications perspective, this issue of the terms keep coming and we need to have consistent uh, and, and thoughtful messaging so that we're addressing sort of the right audiences and being specific and, and thoughtful. And um, um, so I think there was a lot that you've presented for us to unpack as we move forward through the conversation. Um, Jarek, I'd, I'd like to come to you next. Um, you're with an insurance company, um, and I'm hoping you can tell us um, what it is that attracted your company to expand from property insurance to agricultural insurance in the Philippines. And I think one of the things we've talked about a little bit today is how there's so many different players and stakeholders coming into the conversation. And, and if you could tell us a little bit about that from um, the insurance company perspective. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Janet, and good afternoon. Um, so what you're exactly saying, Janet, is one of the reasons why we got interested to get into microinsurance. It's really because of our work in, at, in agriculture insurance. It's really because of our work in, in microinsurance uh, that we feel that the necessary extension of ourselves, because we're covering more than 10 million Filipinos and about 20% of them are farmers, uh, in microinsurance, we, we have a lot of partnership with microfinance institutions. That's why we, we have access to the agriculture sector, to the farmers, right? So, so it's really because of what we do in microinsurance that really will allows us to, to extend our efforts to agriculture insurance. Now, what we were finding out, and this was when we started you know, doing something more than five years ago with agriculture insurance, there's an evolving thought within Pioneer that real value and impact to our clients really of insurance can't be done by insurance alone. You know, we, we have understood that there is an ecosystem around our clients in the case of microinsurance with microfinance, it's understanding how they manage their 
their financial lives and how insurance can become part of that piece of whole. So it's that very same idea, Janet, that intrigued us to jump into, into agriculture insurance because precisely there are just so many stakeholders in the ecosystem and we feel that that has to be recognized and nothing can actually be fully be impactful for the farmers if insurance will not come into, into the picture and do, do what it's supposed to do. So that's essentially where our interest uh, came from, Janet. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I think that that is, a, you know, I think important for us to remember that there are, you know, a variety of, of stakeholders not only involved in the conversation, but, you know, also people who are going to be coming into this and, and factors that, you know, we may not immediately recognize, um, you know, or, or you know, non-traditional, you know, participants or what have you, but that really it needs to be a holistic and, and um, you know, that, that this is a situation that everybody um, has contributions to make too. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Gordon, my next question is for you. Um, from your perspective, um, how should uh, the private sector be actively engaged in deploying um, climate resilient um, germplasm um, for smallholder farmers? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Jan. Um, my first point there would be a deeper understanding of uh, the market um, in terms of these new crops that are being uh, developed um, and in terms of the private sector wanting to venture uh, into uh, these new crops, uh, they may not be operating uh, with them. Um, so we need to understand the, the markets uh, in terms of market data. We need to understand the farmers. We need to understand the socioeconomic um, factors that may be involved. We need to understand and define um, a segment, a market segment. Uh, therefore, the, the sizes, uh, the values, uh, so that as private sector now, we can focus and make resources available on how to enter into uh, these new crops or the germplasm that is already available. Then also we need to look at capacity building or training um, to make sure that uh, these seed companies, they are proper, uh, they've got proper seed business uh, structures especially those that are uh, upcoming. Uh, you, you may find that some organization may not have line maintenance, may not have parent seed department, may not have pilot assurance departments, may not have um, proper structures in production. But all uh, that we that I'm saying is the structure must be um, a continuum designed to deliver uh, a product uh, to the farmers. Then in terms of getting access to, to, to the germplasm, uh, nothing beats direct um, access or licensing of uh, products developed to the private sector. Um, of course, the process remains a structured process, but to remove any form of restrictions that slow down product, the rate of product reach uh, to the farmers. Then, of course, we need to look at the variety of, variety of turnover uh, processes uh, in terms of uh, uh, what happens after R&D, which the, the, the organizations like CIMIT uh, would have done in terms of the product development, uh, in terms of route to market approaches. Some people use strips, some people use demos, some people use uh, blitz packs. Um, then steps, overall steps uh, in terms of uh, building up uh, uh, stocks of the, the variety. Then over and above supply chain constraints, you might find that um, sometimes because of the nature uh, of the environment to be very difficult in terms of infrastructure to come up with the uh, enough stocks uh, that may uh, be required by the markets for a particular uh, product. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, yeah, I think that, the, again, there were a number of really interesting points that I hope I'll have a chance to unpack a little bit as our discussion continues. I and mean, one of those that I really appreciated was the, um, you know, thinking through what capacity building actually means more concretely. I and mean, that was very, I think, interesting. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Tor, if I can turn to you, could you give us um, a, a donor perspective on investments related to climate resilience and plant health management? Um, and 
I think, you know, why are these seen as important or maybe why aren't they seen as more important um, would be another way to think about that. Sure, thank you, Janet. And uh, good morning and afternoon, everyone. Um, so I wanna give you kind of the high level response. I'm actually stepping in for Rob Bertram, who is USAID's chief scientist. Um, so I wanna give you kind of that higher level uh, response uh, from Rob. And then I had a little bit of uh, perspective from, from being the donor on the ground and working directly with um, our host country uh, counterparts. Um, to start with, uh, we do know that climate change is linked to biotic threats as well as abiotic ones. Um, the higher temperatures and erratic rainfall patterns uh, do serve to spread, to hasten the spread of crops, pests, crop pests and diseases. Um, the disease vectors in particular uh, are sensitive to the changing rainfall patterns and vegetation cycles in a way that leads to either new threats altogether or unexpected, emer unexpected emergence of um, some of those traditional challenges that we've had. Um, investing in agricultural research is one way that countries can build up a capacity uh, to generate informal surveillance systems based on the research and extension workers closely, who are closely connected with the farming communities. Um, I think that this relates back to some of what uh, the previous panelists and presenters have said about making sure that, uh, that the research is directly linked to uh, the, the situation on the ground as a way to kind of do those, those first early warning systems. Um, in, in a way, we see research and innovation capacity is fully aligned with preparedness and early warning uh, uh, actions for emerging threats to crops. We even see potential for these networks to convey real-time information regarding other threats as well. Uh, like for example, um, some of the threats that might emerge from mixed farming systems that include livestock. For donors, when we think about the investment value proposition uh, for, for countries, by linking investment in research, extension, and preparedness, including the networks that encompass the agro dealers or other providers of inputs and advisory services, I would add in um, the insurance uh, sector as well, uh, uh, as Garrett had talked about, we can help strategically position countries to rapidly identify and respond to emerging threats. Um, strategically targeted research investments promote integrated systems that link scientific expertise, extension agents, and producers in ways that allow for rapid flow of information. This can lead to rapid assessment of threats, including through remote and digital tools, um, as Anna had been discussing uh, in, in the Philippines, and helping to identify the severity, threat, and extent of factors that can threaten uh, food, our food security gains. We then need to coordinate the locally emerging threats with the global research for uh, development efforts, as, uh, as Prasanna had mentioned earlier. So much of climate adaptation revolves around the sound management of soil and, and water resources, along with the deployment of crop genetic and management practices that help to ensure or conserve soil moisture and increase resource use efficiency. But for plant health, biotic stress management also looms large. For example, how best to manage and mitigate drought stress through conservation ag practices that conserve water and biomass, biomass, but also near-term winds that combine climate resist, resilience, income gains, and reduce environmental impact uh, per, foot, per, per unit of production. Generating more robust farming systems helps reduce risk from major climate threats in a way to, it uh, is a way to help d drive rural growth and gains. South-South collaboration is essential. Many countries are already experiencing climatic uh, conditions that may soon be likely in new or different regions. Factors related to climate, elevation, et cetera, may help to accelerate the uptake of, of these uh, conditions. The integration of good agronomic practices with improved knowledge and tools for adaptation is going to be key for helping us to promote food security as well as livelihoods going into the future. So I wanted to add on to that, um, that donor investments in, uh, in, in research and uh, particularly as related to climate change and 
um, and emerging threats to crops really can help to build on host government investments. The truth is, is that our host country governments uh, are acutely aware of the effects and the imminent threats of climate change. And so if we are truly partnering very well with, uh, with our counterparts, then we are able to uh, kind of leverage those investments, not only to, to drive the global research agenda, but also to ensure that it's able to be um, done in a more applied way so that it isn't just pure science, uh, hey, there's a threat over here. And, um, <laughs> and, and so we go and we try to find a solution, but instead trying to, to work closely uh, with the folks on the ground through those integrated networks that I was just talking about uh, to ensure that, that the, the information is flowing both ways um, and that the technologies are actually getting to the ground where they're, where they're useful and effective. Um, I'm gonna leave it there for now and then we'll, uh, I look forward to the further discussion in a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, speaking of that further discussion, I just wanna remind our audience that you can add questions and comments in the uh, question answer um, at the uh, bottom of your screen so that we can um, hopefully have some time to address any questions from our audience um, before the end of our session. But we do have another round of questions um, for our panelists that I'd like to get to. And my next set of questions looks at opportunities in this space. I mean, we've talked a lot about what's needed um, and, um, and, and you know, potential challenges and things, but I'd like for us to kind of turn this a little bit and, and think about opportunities. Um, and Pramod, I'd like to come back to you first, if that's all right. Um, where do you see opportunities for cross-country learning and implementation? Yeah, I think that's really a great opportunity, I would say. So in terms of climate resilience and even uh, overall health solutions, there are lots of local level experiences in Global South. So a documentation of them, you know, of the successes as well as failures, I think often we ignore failures, would be quite relevant for countries to learn from each other. So I think that's something really quite important. Also, as we just heard from different speakers, uh, the number of tools that have been made available, for example, for food security, monitoring and planning, uh, early warning systems. Most often they work at global scale, but they have not really been explored at local scale, whereas we understand that the challenges are much more at local scale and that's really going to be difficult. So some of those tools, if this can be made available and could be customized to address local food security monitoring, I think that would really be great. And related to that is investment plans. You know, How do we make investment plans to take care of local situation and local needs? Insurance models, a lot is being talked about insurance all the time. I think in time to come, it is going to become even more important due to increasing climate risk. And we have in developing countries, different types of models. We just heard one example from Philippines, but back home, for example, India has one of the very large insurance program. In Latin America, there's uh, that uh, country level risk management plans. So there are several, several types of uh, insurance models which are common. Uh, again, there are success and failures in all of these models. So I think a good understanding of them uh, will really help uh, different uh, countries of Global South to understand them. My final point would be, uh, we need to explore much more bundled solutions, not just talking insurance in isolation, not just talking varieties in isolation. And there are examples in few countries where people have uh, tried this bundling insurance with seeds, for example. I know in some places in Africa, that's quite common, but that type of lessons, if those could be customized for different countries in Global South, I think that would be quite a useful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jarek, I'm gonna come over to you now. Um, I understand your company um, was interested in developing crop insurance products for uh, using satellite-based data, among other tools. Um, but you've encountered um, challenges in scaling agriculture insurance. Um, can you tell us a little bit about these challenges, but then again, also where you see future opportunities um, for private sector-led um, agricultural insurance um, in climate vulnerable parts of the Philippines? Oops, 
we've lost your camera. Yeah, I, I, Janet, I, I had to switch off my camera because I'm struggling oh, with okay. my signal, but but no I hope worries. you can you can you can hear me clearly. Yeah. Yes, I can. So uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, we we did attempt to to look at um, developing crop insurance via satellite based data. We did look at a lot of technology solutions, primarily because we're motivated by doing things differently in the Philippine market. Uh, there's a lot of indemnity insurance that's being done here, and it hasn't really been successful in terms of um, improving the penetration gap of agriculture insurance and insurance in general here in the country, right? But the, 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 the challenge that we're seeing here, Janet, is, you know, um, it's, we know now that using technology is not a cure all. Oh, Jarek, I think we've lost your audio. Just as he was getting to a really good point too. Are you there? Uh, can you hear me now? I can, yes. Can you hear me? Now? Yes. You were just saying that we lost okay, you sorry, right when you were sorry, saying sorry, that um, technology is not a, a cure-all. Yeah, yeah. So, so Janet, we're learning that technology isn't a cure-all for a lot of the problems. Uh, it does add value because of the scale that we need to make insurance work, right? I mean, the biggest one of the biggest problems in agriculture insurance in the Philippines is the speed at which we can serve claims. And we, we were hopeful that technology, satellite-based satellite based data can help us, help that. But we were also realizing, Janet, that there has to be a careful balance between high-tech and low-tech solutions. The, the market that we're trying to serve here is not natural to any digital solution. You know, if you look at the profile of the average Filipino farmer, these are the types of people in our population that probably can live without the basic technology and mobile solutions that we have. So, and we had to carefully understand at which part of the customer journey should we use technology for, because there is still space for channel, but we have to carefully understand at what part of the, of the ecosystem does it add value and where, where humans are better equipped to offer that value. And in which case technology then you know, uh, can most be helpful to humans if they allow you humans to efficiently do the job, but not totally be replaced by technology. That's what we're actually learning from, you know, from, from all of this working with farmers and agriculture insurance. I'll pause it. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I I really, you know, appreciated that uh, that point. I think that you know, careful understanding that you referred to um, in terms of understanding the situation and really thinking through what the right solution is and the and the technology, you know, for a particular context. And I think that that listening across, um, you know, and that that understanding of of the particulars of a local context is something that we've heard throughout. Um, our presentations and discussion today. So, you know, I really appreciated that, um, you know, drawing that out. Um, Gordon, I, you know, coming over to you, I'd like to ask you, as you reflect on what you've heard today, what opportunities do you see for public-private partnerships in this space? Okay. Um, I, I think I'll start off with the uh, synergies eh? uh, in terms of infrastructure, uh, technology, uh, digital tools development um, for screening of um, either varieties, germplasm, and special phenotyping uh, platform. Earlier on, we, we had some work that is being done in Kenya there on MLN, uh, on full MOM, uh, and things like that. So that's an opportunity, that's an area uh, where we can collaborate or um, where we can have synergies or opportunities um, arising. Um, then we also look at uh, um, enhancing access uh, 
and the training on novel breeding uh, support technologies um, for phenotyping, uh, genotyping, uh, mechanization, uh, so that we improve speed of germplasm improvement and uh, turning around. Um, I, I, I need not uh, emphasize uh, access and the building capacity to new breeding tools uh, like in, uh, gene editing. Um, then the, the upscaling uh, and accessing uh, of varieties uh, that will have been developed, uh, they can easily uh, come into the pipeline of um, uh, seed companies for deployment to, uh, to the markets. Then there's also delivery of um, uh, gains that would have made uh, would have been made from pre-breeding um, research activities, so that this can be channeled channeled now uh, into germplasm that is uh, normally uh, would have been obsolete um, because of new pests and diseases. And uh, this is an an area where we think there can be opportunities. Um, the listing of varieties on the regional catalogs. Uh, it improves delivery uh, in wider reach to, to, to small scale farmers. And this is an area where the private sector uh, can uh, easily cooperate uh, with the whatever material that will have been developed from um, organizations like, like CIMIT. Then diversification into uh, new product portfolios. Uh, more and more crops are getting important. Those that used to be called uh, often um, and, and, as, and as new material comes up um, uh, from these crops, the private sector can easily take them on board um, and the, uh, take them across the markets um, so that we address uh, these issues of uh, resilience. Uh, I thank you. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. And, you know, thinking about how, you know, as, as new, you know, crops are identified or new opportunities are identified, being able to, to scale those up and out to, to build that resilience, I think is, is a really a great point for, you know, an opportunity. Um, uh, Tor, I'd like to come to you to close this portion of our discussion. One last question to you, um, and also inviting you to reflect on what you've heard today, both in the discussion and in the earlier presentations. I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on international research opportunities in this area. Thank you. Uh, so I guess I wanted to talk a little bit more rather than uh, kind of the, the research specific activities, I wanted to talk a little bit more about scaling efforts. Um, because when Pramod was just talking about the bundling of solutions, uh, that's one of the big things that we have been focused on uh, in trying to, to move some of the technologies uh, out of the research halls and into the hands of, of producers. Um, for instance, and we, we do a lot of private sector engagement in order to do that. So we, we bring together, for instance, um, I was working on a horticulture activity where we brought together the researchers to provide uh, the, the specific recommendations on, on best agricultural practices. Um, we brought together the extension workers um, and, the, and the private sector ag input stealers um, in order to, to pull all of, all of those solutions into one uh, that, we, that we were providing for the farmers. Um, I, I think that a, one way that we have uh, to, again, speak to way, ways that we failed in the past, one of the, one of the things that we've uh, not been as great at is ensuring that our research is adapted to the local uh, solution. Um, and I think that several of the presenters here have touched on that. Technologies have to be accessible. Um, for instance, uh, one of the things that we're doing here in East Africa is we work with the local research organizations to increase their capacity to produce the early generation seed. And then we use our networks with private sector organizations to link uh, that to the seed companies uh, so that the improved seed becomes readily available. Um, we also need to be aware of um, global supply chain issues. Uh, I think that as much as we talk about resilience in the face uh, of climate change, uh, resilience is to all kinds of different shocks and stresses. Um, we need to be sure that we aren't just promoting things that are too difficult to, to access. Uh, in the past, that's been things like 
promoting complex machinery whose parts aren't available for replacement once they break. Um, and then now we're really seeing it in, in the face of the, the Ukraine, the, the Russia's war on Ukraine um, with the limit, limited access to fertilizer. Um, and so while our activities have been promoting the use of chemical fertilizers, um, they have become less, less available to, to farmers. So we need to be sure that our research is going hand in hand with um, availability, trying to promote availability and accessibility. Um, and then finally, I, I think that one of the solutions to scaling out all of this, um, and again, some of the other uh, panelists have touched on this, is continuing to work uh, on finance availability and accessibility. So th there are a couple of different ways that we can do that in order to be able to scale research, uh, whether that be loan guarantees or, or helping financial institutions to develop appropriate credit packages. Um, but also, you know, we're starting to look at, uh, at, at carbon credits as, as a way to promote um, some, some climate finance uh, as well. So um, that doesn't exactly say, hey, here's what I think we should start researching right now. Uh, but I think honestly, that's gonna be really different depending, <laughs> depending on which field you're coming from and, and all the rest of it. So that's, that's more, how do I think that we can try to get some of the really great research that all of these centers are producing into the hands of producers to make it so that they are more resilient to not just climate change, but other, resist, uh, other shocks and stresses going into the future. Great, thank you. And I think actually that tees up where I'm going to go with, um, with our discussion next um, very well. So thank you for that. Um, I'm actually going to invite all of our speakers to turn their cameras on at this point. Um, our chat has been a little quiet in terms of questions. So instead, I'm going to ask everyone to take about a minute to come in on the same question. So everybody listen up to this question. Um, I'll call on you um, in turn to, to share your thoughts. But what I'd like to know, um, thinking about all that's been covered today, all the presentations and the comments and the discussions, um, what, is, what are you taking back to the work that you do um, in terms of thinking about this, this question of, of building resilience and, and transformative adaptation um, for you know, particularly looking at small scale farmers? Um, so what is your takeaway message from all that you've heard today? Everybody is going to get the same question, but I'm going to ask John to come in first. I get punished for having gone over time on my <laughs> session. Thanks, Janet. Um, I think for me, it, it would be that we face tremendous challenges, but challenges are opportunities. And the last two hours has just been a reminder that a lot of good work has been done with impact, whether it's what Alice and Joyce were talking about. Pramod referred to failures. And I think working together in an honest way in partnerships from the beginning, recognizing in the past where things haven't worked and looking at where they haven't and have worked, and just together, keeping an eye on the overall objectives. Why is it that we're engaged in this together? What are we aspiring to do? And therefore, I come out of it pleasantly optimistic, not totally daunted and paralyzed by the challenge we face, but optimistic that we can continue to do good and do even more good. And also delighted that COVID's behind us. So without racking up too many air miles, we can continue these sorts of interactions face to face and actually make sure that we have that scaling impact that Tor was talking about. We have the tools, we have the brains, we have many of the solutions, and we have the ability to put these into greater use by working together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Pramod, I'm going to come to you next with the same question. Um, what, is, what is it that you're taking away from today's conversation as you think of, about going back into your work? Yes, so uh, it's a slightly challenging one. Let me say, as researchers, we have made tremendous progress. We continue to make progress, and there are challenges in doing more and more research. 
Of course, that's something that we continue to need address. But if you really want to scale, it's time to re-emphasize that partnership with diverse stakeholders, especially next users and end users is very critical. And that should be cemented right from day one. Otherwise, research would remain in labs under such papers. That's a lesson that has been always there, but we just get reminded again. Thank you for that. Um, Alice, if I can come to you next, um, what would you say your takeaway is as, as you leave this conversation? Um, I like the topic of uh, mentioning about technology is not the solution. I think technology is, is useful, but we have to look at other dimensions and that is important also for scaling to make sure that we take into account social aspects, getting uh, access particularly for smallholder farmers to make sure that uh, they are not left behind. Um, I like also um, mentions about the challenges, especially the opportunities, because I think that holds promise that we can together work on uh, solutions to make uh, farming more resilient. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gordon, can I come to you with this question? What would you say your takeaway is from the conversation? Okay, uh, thanks. Um, I think uh, uh, there's a, a fair understanding um, of the challenges that we, we are facing in the and the challenges that we are going to face in the in the future and i think as teams it's in our hands um, and the capabilities are already there for us to uh, define uh, that future in the manner uh, that we want so that uh, everyone lives in a comfortable uh, future thank you Thank you. Um, Jarek, can I ask you this question? What would you say your, your takeaway is? What jumped out at you, um, particularly yeah. from today's discussion? So, so Janet, uh, that we have to expand. Oh, you muted somehow. Uh, sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, my major takeaway is we have to expand our ecosystem towards the bigger universe, right? So we, we have been working with partners, but it's pretty much limited to, to our immediate sphere of influence. But there are a lot of other stakeholders, and a number of them are in fact here in the Philippines that we still have to, to take a look at, because I believe these stakeholders in the bigger ecosystem can really, really add that value, uh, value to us. And one of the things that we need to do, Janet, is to really come out and be more visible to to, to everyone in the ecosystem. So that's a major takeaway for us as an insurance company. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, yeah, it's, you know, something for all of us to consider, you know, is, is this opportunity to step back and look at all the different players who are, are you know, in this space and, and the possible stakeholder connections we can make. Um, so thank you. Um, Tor, can I come to you with this question? Um, you answered a little bit in your last discussion question, but what would you say your, what, what really, sparked your interest or, or will be your main takeaway? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think that a lot of us kind of had an idea that, that, that these sorts of things were where we were already thinking. Um, I will say, I think this was a really great reminder for me. Um, and I'll give you a, for instance, what I'm gonna directly and immediately take, it, take away from this is um, I was recently contacted by uh, a researcher from IITA about the emergence of bunchy banana disease um, here in Tanzania. And, you know, and I was planning to get back to them and just kind of let's hear more about it. Um, but after this discussion today, I'm reminded that maybe I shouldn't just say, yes, let me hear more about it as the donor. And then we'll talk about, you know, ways that we can fund research directly. But maybe I should say, hey, I also, I work with the Tanzanian Horticulture Association, which is a private sector uh, group that has recently actually uh, been in the newspapers about exporting uh, exporting banana materials. So maybe I should have that meeting 
um, with them there as well as the um, IITA, as well as uh, some of the other donors that have expressed interest in it, like Gates Foundation, and maybe some of our counterparts um, at the at the Ministry of Agriculture. So it's just a reminder to me that um, that, that if we really are going to get to those good solutions, maybe we should uh, we should from the from the beginning of those conversations, we should include several of the different partners to make sure uh, that they that the solutions are actually applicable and scalable. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that's a that is definitely a great point. It's been wonderful to hear so many different perspectives today, and a, and a good reminder of of the value that comes from that. Um, Prasanna, um, I know you've been having some trouble with your uh, connection, so I'm not sure if you're able to come in. I'll just give you a second to try, and if not, then maybe we can add comments to the chat. But I see you on audio, so that's good. Yeah, I. I, I, you can see me perhaps, but let's hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the panelists and for the speakers. They, this is indeed a very rich discussion focusing not just on innovations, but also on partnerships and also, also about business models uh, and how do we get to the farming communities and empower them much more than what we have uh, done all through. Uh, really grateful to all the speakers and the panelists uh, for this very, very important and enriching discussion. And we will, of course, we have recorded it. We will share it uh, through our social media uh, so that it can reach uh, a much wider audience. Uh, once again, on behalf of, of John, myself, and, uh, and Janet, uh, many, many thanks to all of you. Um, finally, uh, Janet, I think the closing remarks are from Anna Maria. Okay. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you, Prasanna. And yes, um, I will echo those thanks to all of our speakers um, and presenters. I think it's been a really rich discussion. Um, and we have almost, co almost come to the end of our time. But before we go, I'm going to ask Anna Maria Lobo Guerrero, who is the lead of CGIR's research initiative on climate resilience and also the research director for climate action at the Alliance of Bioversity International in SEAT to offer her reflections and closing thoughts. Anna Maria, it's never easy to come in and synthesize an entire discussion, especially one as rich and varied as this, but I know if anyone is up to the challenge, it's you. Can I turn over to you? Thank you very much, Janet. And uh, I'll try to do my best. It's very hard given the really interesting ideas that were shared, but also I have only five minutes. If you give me half an hour, I'll do a better job than it next time, but I'll try to do my best. Let me start by saying that um, I really enjoyed the conversation and I enjoy it because this is a very good example or testimony uh, on how really CDR is willing to address some of the issues discussed. So it's not just blah, 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 that we want to do research in a different way, but the way that this um, conversation was set. So uh, having and being able to hear from private sector, from the donor community, from researchers, not only from the CGR, but also ones that are coming from national systems. Having Janet as representing the communications sphere and providing her knowledge, expertise, in terms of framing this conversation. This is really the way that we should be working. And it was highlighted by many of the speakers and participants in the sense that we need to work uh, across disciplines. We need to involve stakeholders. And something that I really like that was mentioned, not the traditional suspects. We need to go beyond the partners that we usually work with and collaborate with. We need to be innovative in terms of uh, this collaboration. So um, one thing perhaps that I missed, and it was the voice of the farmers. And this is something that we need to consider each time more. And many people said that it is important to understand what is happening on the ground. It is very important to really be able to respond to demands and the challenges that are happening on the ground. I think that each time more, we have the necessity to listen to the voice of the people that we are trying to work for. Uh, because sometimes we have an idea of what they are needing, but it's not always the case that uh, this is true. 
And once that you put your boot and you get into the ground, you understand better the challenges and therefore you are able to co-generate better solutions. So that's perhaps something that we can do more in following events. Um, so something that really like from Tor, she, she just set up a very nice agenda for research and in one of her questions, and I'm so happy, and that was like music to my ears, ears because I'm so happy to say that a, a lot of the, um, of the issues that were discussed in relation to this research agenda are the ones that we really want to do through the initiatives of the one CGR. So it's, I think that it's very nice to see that we are aligned in relation to that. So now let me go into messages that I heard many times from speakers and participants that I think that could, very, could help to summarize what we have heard. So uh, Martin said no silver bullet. And I think that that's very important to take into account. The solutions are not going to be the same. We need to be mindful about specificities of context, geographies, um, populations, et cetera. So there's no one solution, and that's very important to take into account. Um, it was also stressed the need for transformation. I think that we are uh, in agreement that we are not on track to reach many of the goals that we need to reach in terms of food, SDGs, Paris Agreement, and that we need to have or deliver research that is oriented to action, to come up with ideas that are actionable, that are really looking towards the solution. Um, I, w there was also a lot of many times mentioning the challenge of the scaling. So we have really nice pilots where we have seen things happening, uh, but we still need to think further about that. And some of the uh, responses were in relation to thinking about innovative financial mechanisms for scaling, uh, working with the private sector as well. Something that was also that many people talk about that was the importance of thinking beyond technology. Technologies are important, but uh, thinking about these bundles, Pramod uh, uh, introduced this terminology as much as uh, we shouldn't be including more terminologies, but this bundle approach where we think how to uh, go beyond technologies, think about the enabling environment in terms of capacity building, in terms of the right policies, in terms of communications as well. So I think that that was really, really important. Um, another thing that was also discussed was the importance of uh, taking into account this equi equity uh, framework. And being a way, and I think that this is something that we need to do more in the CGR, it's for taking seriously this issue of maladaptation and how, and, and one of the speakers mentioned that how through the solutions that we are proposing, we need to have be real careful about not um, getting into maladaptation issues. And then I will just finish by saying that the, the word that I heard most was partnership. Partnerships slash collaboration, slash uh, key actors coming together. Um, so I think that that, for me, that would be the main message, the importance of thinking about this collaboration, different actors, um, inter and transdisciplinary, and something very important in terms of sustainability. Uh, how do we, we make sure that all these solutions that we are proposing, either bundles, uh, how to uh, respond to new pests and diseases, climate variability and extremes happening. How do we make from the very beginning of starting thinking about these solutions that they are sustainable, that they are continuing through time? And I think that part of that is thinking about the right collaborations. Who needs to be part of this research process? Not at the end, not when we say, yeah, you, we're done, the solution is here, but from the very beginning, who is going to be responsible our communities empowered to continue working uh, using those solutions. So I think that that's also collaborations and partnerships are key for sustainability. Let me finish with that, uh, Janet, but really, really happy and excited about all that I heard today. Thank you, Anna Maria. And yes, I think that, you know, one of the, the things that, um, you know, that I'd like to draw out from what you said also is the 
the way that, you know, kind of us bringing together all of these different conversations, not only are we bringing our own voices to the table, but we're bringing, to, you know, to the table, the voices of others, you know, whose perspectives, we, you know, we have been informed by, and then also we have the opportunity to extend that invitation to the table to other voices and really kind of, um, you know, amplify and, and, and increase the engagement and the involvement to make sure that, you know, that we really are reaching those um, who, who we are setting out to, to support. Um, so thank you very much for that. And, and I'd like to thank again, all of our speakers for their insights and ideas, and also our technical team for ensuring everything flowed smoothly throughout our event today. Um, and then thanks finally to everyone who joined us, um, you know, either, either the today, or if you are watching this recording at a later time, um, for helping to create um, such a rich and inspiring discussion. Um, and so we look forward to further conversations and to working with all of you moving forward. And on behalf of John and Prasanna, um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone again for being part of our conversation. Mm -hmm.